Hey friend, welcome back to the Smoke Circle for season three. It's great to be back with you. I just wanted to pop in before I start the show because I got hit way harder by the old cannabis than I wanted to, and I ended up zipping through the intro. So I want to give our esteemed guest the intro that he deserves. Dr. Darren R. Reed is a history professor at Coventry University in Coventry, England. He was with us on episodes 52 and 53, and while he teaches classes on a few subjects and his main academic focus is on Native American history and indigeneity, he's incredibly passionate about pop culture history, which is what he's bringing us this time around. Also, really quick, there is some traffic noise that can be heard at some parts throughout this, more so in the second half, which is my pet peeve, and I'm so sorry about that. I only caught it when we were in post-production, and not all of it could be edited out, so there'll be some parts where you'll hear some trucks or road noise. My apologies in advance about that, and I'm going to do what I can to prevent that in the future. So thanks for your understanding. Now let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome to Hightailing Through History, a history podcast where two sisters get high and surprise each other with a story from history's vault of the weird and the wonderful. I'm Laurel. I'm Katie. It's officially season three. Welcome. Yay. And also on the day that this comes out, it's going to be 419. So one day before our annual holiday, uh, Stoners <laughs> Unite. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, class is back in session and we are with our favorite history professor, Dr. Darren Reed. Yay. Hello. The little scene third sister. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Reed, it's so great to have you back here again with us. And uh, for our listeners, he was on our two-part series for Indigenous representation in popular films. So that was episodes 52 and 53. They were a hit. Everybody loved them. And they shot up to our top 10 pretty quickly. So we are so lucky to have you back with us again. So hello, hello. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited. We have some fun stuff that we are going to be uh, talking about today. I know I'm really excited to chat and uh, just, sorry, I'm uh, I'm a little more stoned than I wanted to be today, folks. So this is like, uh, you know, when you're trying to run in your dreams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of what things feel like right now. So maybe we should just talk about what, uh, what we're imbibing in today to help <laughs> celebrate uh, season three. Uh, uh-huh. Let's go yeah, so some fruit cider. Yeah, it's very I think, boring, but there we go. <laughs> no, it tastes so good. It's like a uh, like fizzy juice, uh, which is nice. I think that's what you had actually the last time you were on with us as well. I think so. I think mm-hmm. I'm very consistent. <laughs> <laughs> we're boring Excellent. today. I'm drinking water. We're staying hydrated. That's good. Bravo. Good for you. Taking a little bit of a cannabis break, but that's okay. Doesn't mean I love it any less. You said you had a smoothie too, though, right? I do, so like, yeah. It's it, why do you want to know what's in it? I I do, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's got a little bit of whole milk, yogurt, a banana, strawberry, spinach, cocoa, bee pollen. Oh, uh, collagen. There's one okay. more thing in there. What is that last? One? Oh, chia seeds. Oh, and chia, honey, chia and honey. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Those are all good it's a meal replacement smoothie because I forget to eat, so these are a great way for me to go around that. <laughs> I feel like collagen isn't necessarily a food stuff. Is that something you should be putting <laughs> in your smoothie? Like, isn't that something uh, to put in your lips to make them fuller? Actually, I'm going to be a freaking nerd here for two seconds. There was a whole study done by this gal who is in, oh, I'm totally going to screw this up some form of very fancy, important microbiology that affects the body somehow. She did a whole, I don't know if it was a thesis or what you call those things, uh, about how collagen is good for the mucosal membranes of your gut. And that's how they're looking at healing. um, Was it leaky gut and stuff like that? So yeah, collagen is important. (laughs) I think I'm familiar with that scholar's work. Are you? No. Okay, I was like, what? I, I need a little bit more specificity than a, some girl who does biology or something. I feel bad because I have, the, I actually have the paper, like the actual printed out paper yeah. that she did. It's on my refrigerator. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I feel like collagen is for plastic <laughs> surgery. Maybe call me old fashioned. But... Oh, it's man. just powdered bone is all it is. 
Ew. It's gross, yeah. I, I don't taste good. it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be drinking it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very picky. Nice. Well, cool. Thank you for letting us know what's in that uh, <laughs> that smoothie. I don't and know why you wanted to know. on collagen. Well, you, you have like elaborate ones. I was just curious what, what was going on there. It was but... elaborate. <laughs> what are you yeah. drinking? Uh, I have I have some water to try and counteract how <laughs> wild I just got on on that edible, and uh, so I'm gonna hydrate because I'm going to just slowly dry out and just turn into <laughs> a sponge over the course of this episode. <laughs> Okay, so my history lesson today takes us back to the 1970s and the 1980s. I'm going to be giving you a little bit of video game history. In particular, I thought I could tell you guys the story of how Tetris, one of the most iconic games ever made, came to be. Is that Ooh. a game you guys are familiar with? Let me just double check. I'm not making assumptions that run sound. <laughs> oh, oh, heck yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Retro okay. Arcade, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, that was a loaded question because I knew the answer would be yes, because I knew that it doesn't matter the fact that I'm from Scotland. Sitting in Scotland right now asking that question, you guys are in the Midwest, in the United States, or if you lived in sub-Saharan Africa or wherever, almost everyone on the planet has encountered or been influenced some way by this game. It is to video games what Dark Side of the Moon or Thriller is to music. It is yeah. ubiquitous. In fact, as of 2024, 202 million copies of Tetris have been sold around the world, Ooh. which puts Thriller and Dark Side of the Moon's sales figures to shame. So when we're talking about Tetris, we're talking about a really, really big deal. But what's really exciting about Tetris and what I really love about its history is how it intersects with the story of the Cold War and allows us to sort of explore lots of hidden depths um, to an otherwise quite uninteresting industry that most people sort of see only through the lens of Mario, Sonic, or I don't know, maybe some more modern characters who don't immediately spring to mind. So our story begins in 1957 in Russia with the birth of a guy called Alexei Pajitnov. Pajitnov was the son of an art critic father and a journalistic mother, and as a child would play frequently with something called pentominoes. These were little uh, shapes made up of five individual um, segments or elements. Pent, meaning five, is where that comes from. The idea of the game is very simple. Is you'd move these shapes around and you would try to combine them in different ways to make different images. But the part that really arrested young Alexei's imagination was not the game itself, but trying to stuff all of the shapes back into their box to find a way to make them all fit together. Mm. So pin in that, we will be coming back to that later on. Like Alexei was a strong, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Advocate for... Um, computer sciences early on. He studied applied mathematics at the Moscow Aviation Institute and graduated in 1979 and would otherwise have lived a life in complete obscurity um, from the rest of the Western world had it not been for the fact that he began to work for the Soviet Academy of Sciences, where he would frequently test new equipment and design video games for them. He didn't design video games because there was an audience for them, but certainly it was not an audience for them. In fact, the only reason he made games at all was just as a way to test um, whatever equipment came his way. And on one fateful day, he was given an Electra 60, um, which I'll tell you about in a little moment, which was a very basic computer, couldn't even generate graphics. And he remembered playing with the Pentominos as a child and instead began to devise a game around the game he made for himself when he was young, trying to stuff those Pentominos back in their box. He didn't want to use five mm -hmm. elements, five uh, pieces made up of five elements. He wanted to do it with four elements, hence Tetronomos, and ultimately Tetris was born. Okay, so what's the context that's happening here? As Alexei is building this gaming prototype around about 1984, 1985, um, the United States and the Soviet Union, or the Western world and the Soviet Union, are engaged in a renewed period of hostilities. After the election of Ronald Reagan, we begin to see the breakdown of detente. Quick history lesson. Um, the Cold War <laughs> exists in three separate phases. Okay, For some older people, it's really difficult to even talk about one Cold War. They will think about two Cold Wars, for example. For younger people, 
it's easier to think about that whole period from 1946 onward as one Cold War. But for those who lived in the time, there was the first Cold War, which was very, very distinct, very specifically happened up until the late 1960s, sort of culminating with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then you have the period of detente, which takes us through most of the 70s, which is a period of reduced tensions. And then the second Cold War erupts in the late 1970s as tensions bubble to the surface again, particularly driven by politicians on both sides of the Iron Curtain who are able to benefit from renewed tensions. So as Alexei enters the Moscow Academy um, of Sciences and begins his career as a computer engineer, he is locked firmly behind an Iron Curtain and has access to only limited computer equipment. Let me give you an example. The Electra 60 that he designed, the Tetris game on, could run 250,000 uh, uh, instructions per second compared to a fairly standard computer in the West at the time that we could run 330,000. To put that number into context, today a computer can run around 3,000 million instructions per second. Wow. The Electra 60 had uh, no more than 8 kilobytes of RAM, couldn't even generate graphics, and the original version of Tetris had to be used, made, uh, used, made, in, used, by uh, was made by using text-based <laughs> characters. There we go. I got there. Yeah, the we get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I've had like two or three sips of cider now, so I apologize. <laughs> the inevitable. Welcome to hightailing through history. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, Pajitnov produces this game, and it becomes a hit in the way that a game can only become a hit in the very early days of computing, um, other nerds and engineers, people working in the academy, begin to get copies of it and to play on their computers. And slowly but surely, this game filters out like a virus to all of the computer laboratories around the Soviet Union. And by the time you get to about 1986, 1987, it begins to bleed even further into the Soviet satellite states of Eastern Europe. So very slowly but surely, this game starts to spread and everyone who plays it becomes addicted to it. In fact, in one institution, at least we know, the game itself was specifically banned uh, because employees, and these were medical professionals, kept being found not doing their job and just playing Tetris on whatever computer they could find. So this game was a hit, but the Academy of Sciences for whom Pachinov worked weren't interested at all. They had no interest in something as superfluous as a video game. There was no market for video games in Russia or the USSR at this time. In fact, right into the 1990s, one of the biggest, most successful video gaming platforms in the former Soviet Union was, was based on something called the ZX Spectrum, which was a British microcomputer, so clones of that. And let me tell you, that was out of date by the late 1980s, let alone well into the late 90s where it was still being used in Russia. So even the comparatively recent past, um, Russia's access to the same type of consumer electronics hasn't always been as wide. So back into the, the early 80s, a very, very limited market. There's no opportunity to commercialize this. The second reason there's no opportunity to commercialize this software for poor Pajinov is he lives in a communist super state, the USSR. <laughs> in fact, the USSR specifically claims the sole right to import or export software. So Pajitnov wanted his game to be played. He thought that, that there was something there. And so he began to reach out to people in the Soviet state, hoping that some of them would help him to organize its export to the outside world. And again, what you have to remember is that this guy who's designing and built this game has very little knowledge of how the West works. Who do you even contact? Um, what does a contract look like? Would there be any type of money involved? He had absolutely none of these ideas because the people uh, working in the institutions that he was working in, living in the country or the entity that he was living in, very, very much um, had very uh, limited access to knowledge about the outside world. So the first major development that happened after the creation of the original Tetris was the result of a guy called now, let me try and pronounce this correct. Vadim Gerasimov. I've never said that out loud before. Vadim <laughs> Gerasimov. For anyone who is Russian, please accept my apologies. Now, 
Hadjimov is generally accepted to be the father of Tetris, but Gerasimov had a huge role to play. He was just 16 years old and a high school student, but he had an IBM PC, which made him really, really rare and really, really special in Russia. And he had the knowledge and ability to port, that's to transfer and to readapt, to translate the original Tetris program running on that Electra 60 um, into an IBM um, yeah. compatible version. And the big deal with that is the IBM compatible by the mid 80s was becoming the basic standard for all personal com computers in the Western world. It wasn't yet, but it was on its way. In fact, the PC that you are running this software on now is a direct derivative of the IBM compatible. So anything that runs Microsoft's Windows is essentially a new generation IBM compatible. So he creates a new version of Tetris with graphics and with sound and a scoreboard. You know, lots of basic things were missing. And the first feature complete version of Tetris is completed by 1986. And it's that version that begins to leak out into the satellite states of Eastern Europe. And it's there where East literally met West that business people began to encounter the software and say to themselves, hey, there's a lot of potential here. But boy, did that raise even more questions. How on earth could you license something from the Soviet Union? Who owned the rights? Did the state or did the individual? What were the terms going to be? How would you, could you give them, uh, communicate money to them? How would you make contact with them? Did you need someone from the state to serve as an interlocutor or a translator or an ambassador, so to speak, between them? Lots and lots of questions emerge. But one man emerges um, who very quickly feels he has the answers to them. One hero on the horizon. <laughs> One hero on the horizon. I take my drink. Da, 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 da. Right. I was about to start doing the Jurassic Park thing, and I'm like, nope, no dinosaurs, Katie, stop that. <laughs> One man, fabulously less qualified than anyone in Jurassic Park, Robert Stein <laughs> enters our story. He's perhaps one of the most interesting characters. Because what's a way to happen is he is both the door that allows this piece of Soviet computer culture to enter the rest of the world, and he is also one of the greatest obstacles that stops this piece of Soviet computer culture from entering the rest of the world. Robert Stein is our hero and he is our villain all at the same time. Oh, so on the one no. hand, we've got, we've got Pajimov, sort of Gerasimov is sort of a forgotten character in the story, but pa uh, Pajimov is a way to, um, has created this game but cannot get out into the world and he is getting no support from the inside. But Robert Stein sees this game whilst he's in Hungary on a business trip and says to himself, this has got real money-making potential. And he sends a fax to um, the Soviet agency who's in charge of importing and exporting software. And they're pretty much blasé about email. He faxes, it doesn't email, he faxes the Academy of Sciences. They too are ambivalent. And eventually he faxes Pajimov himself, who says, yes, I am interested in selling this software. I'm very, very interested. And this is where Robert Stein really jumps the gun because like any good Western business person, he co-opts someone else's intellectual property and sells it on before he even has the right to do so. Boy, does he sell it on. He sells it on to an American company called Spectrum Holobyte, who would release the game in the United States. He sells it to Microsoft, the Microsoft. He gives them the European rights. Um, the American version is the one that becomes the really, um, um, how would I put this? The sort of the standard version of Tetris. It's got lots of mm -hmm. imagery from the Soviet Union. It's got Soviet-inspired mm -hmm. folk music. Even though the piece of software itself is state neutral, the Western version of it is all about um, creating a sort of, you know, gateway drug into Soviet culture, for want of a better way of putting oh. it. It okay. is a great way for people who have very limited access to any real knowledge about what's happening in the Soviet Union to actually enjoy a piece of uh, something, a piece of culture that's come from there. The game becomes a sensation overnight. It sells 100,000 copies in its first year. Um, the Microsoft version is released on multiple consoles and computers across Europe. Um, in the 1980s, in the United States, computer com you know, video gaming is all about the Nintendo entertainment system, right? Mm -hmm. yep. You have that one system that dominates the market. In the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe, not at all. Some countries like the Nintendo, but only a little bit. Really, it was all about things like the ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the Commodore Amiga, this huge array of microcomputers. 
And look, that huge array of microcomputers uh, is what Microsoft handles in the 86. The problem is, is as this game is becoming a hit, Stein hasn't actually bought the rights to Tetris. He's just sold it on to other companies. And he doesn't May. get the rights to Tetris until one month after the United States launch of Tetris on the IBM PC. So the good news for him is that no one in the Soviet Union realizes what's happening. And the other piece of good news is it's a sleeper hit. It does become a sensation, but it sells 100,000 copies. Then it sells 200,000 copies, then 300, and so on and so forth. It's a game that just keeps on selling. So Stein has this hit on his hand. He paid $3,000 for the rights for Tetris, uh, at least initially. And then forks over between 75 and 80% of the profits to the Soviet Union. However, now poor old Pajimov, by the way, this time is getting nothing. Oh. I was going to say, what about the OG guy who did all the work? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sweet Katie, no. Uh, <laughs> Pajimov doesn't even begin Maybe. to see a cent of Tetris money until at least the mid-90s. Now, don't feel too bad for him because, you know, the, that does come full circle. But for the yeah. first decade of his product's existence, he saw nothing of it. And the fact that he was mm -hmm. able to make as much money as he has after the peak of Tetris mania. Yeah. Testament to the immortality of the product he made. So don't weep for him too much. But, oh, my goodness, what happened to him? Nothing. He's stuck in the Soviet Union, working for the same company he did before, coding away, making games that no one will ever play. Oh. oh. Right, so there's a little bit more about what Stein does, right? Is he then subdivides up the rights to Tetris, which he now sort of owns, and then sells them in a really complex way. So in reality, what he'd bought was the right to make a computer version of Tetris, right? So I'm, anyone who's listening, I'm putting air quotes around computer, meaning that the people who sold him the rights, they wanted to give him the rights to produce something for the IBM PC, for the ZX Spectrum, for the Commodore 64, something with a keyboard, something you had to program. And he begins to sell it for all varieties of computer games, including consoles, so dedicated units like the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, the Nintendo, or arcade games, whatever. He thought he owned all the rights, or at least pretended that he owned all the rights. And bear in mind, he already sold a bunch of the rights before he even owned them. Who knows what was going through his head? So, uh, Stein sells, for example, the arcade rights to Atari. Atari mm -hmm. then sell the arcade Japanese rights to Sega. And this sort of thing starts to proliferate all around. And eventually you end up with, a, by about 1988, about a dozen, certainly 10 different companies think they own Tetris. <laughs> And all what could go concern, wrong, right? What could go wrong? Not only <laughs> that, but it all comes back to Stein, who doesn't even own Tetris himself. He's only licensed the computer adaptations of it. So he's selling licenses that he doesn't have the rights to, which are then being okay. sold and, and broken up and sold further on to other companies. Then people are buying things and are wondering why there's competing products on the same market. And they're trying to figure out, oh, actually, no, we own the video game console rights, you own the computer rights, so your version can't exist on this platform, it has to exist on that platform. Okay? So what begins to happen, this is where Nintendo enters our story. Here they come. <laughs> but, yeah, they are. Okay. Absolutely. So for, through, <laughs> through the second half of the 80s, Nintendo very unexpectedly came to dominate the U.S. video game market. Um, going back to 1982, there'd been quite a spectacular crash as a result of um, companies like Atari, for example, specifically Atari, but others as well, producing a slew of poor product onto the market. Um, people stopped buying home video consoles. And unlike in Europe, where people transferred over to the, what we called microcomputers, the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, in the United States, it was Nintendo who capitalized on that crash and were able to monopolize the market going into the 1980s. And they were looking to launch a brand new product, the Game Boy. Um, they became very aware very early on that Tetris had a huge opportunity for them to produce a crossover hit, particularly because it was perfect for the portable video game format right it's perfect for small sit down and play sessions mm -hmm. so they begin to negotiate with stein and they begin very early to get frustrated with him and so rather than deal directly with him they go back to the soviets and they ask them 
what rights Stein actually has. And this is where things start to fall apart. Because not only had Stein been selling the rights to Tetris, m many of whom he didn't own, he wasn't paying the Soviets for the licensing deals. So anything he sold directly, he owed 80% oh, yeah. of the profits to the Soviet Union. But anything that, for example, Atari sold or Atari paid for the rights to produce an arcade version didn't go back to the Soviet Union. So they began to look into it and they clarified, actually, this guy only owns the computer rights. But the word computer is very, very broad. So essentially, Nintendo begins to court none other than Alexei Pajimov himself who begins to advocate for them and all of the backroom um, shenanigans, I guess, you, you could say, that are going on behind the scenes, all these sort of business maneuvers. <laughs> and they reach out to Stein and they say, we want to offer you a new contract with better conditions where you'll get a higher royalty rate. And what they do is they bury in a clause that defines a computer as a device with a mouse, and, uh, not a mouse, a keyboard, excuse me, and a monitor. So in other words, he gets a better contract but within that, which he happily signs, but because that contract is for a specific type of computer, and it defines what that type of computer is, you know, has to have its own monitor, has to have its own keyboard, he essentially signs away the rights to Tetris, which a court may or may not have found that he already had. And that invalidates all the other licensing agreements. And it's at that point that Nintendo sign a deal, and they become the owners, at least for about a 10-year period, of Tetris overall, and they begin to sue wow. everyone. <laughs> so Atari, for example, Atari was a way to release a version of Tetris on the Nintendo, and that had to be pulled from shelves. Yeah. Sega, because it owned the Japanese-only arcade rights to Sega, was going to produce a version for its Sega Genesis console <laughs> called Meg Drive in Japan. Had to, they, they, they made 10 physical copies of their game of Tetris and had to pull that from them or pull it before it hit the market. Oh my God. Everything begins to collapse. But out of all of that chaos emerges one of the most wonderful artifacts of the Cold War era Nintendo's Tetris. And for people of a certain age, if I just say that phrase, I bet my bottom dollar you are hearing the theme song <laughs> which is of course a russian folk song playing in your head you can see the russian iconography um uh, it was an absolute landmark of its time okay so that's where the bulk of my story ends but there's a little happy epilogue which is in 1996 alexei pajanov after the collapse of the soviet union uh, regains control of Tetris. He forms a company called Tetris Holdings. And you remember at the beginning, I told you that 202 million copies of Tetris had been sold, right? Well, during the height of Tetris mania, 70 million copies were sold. 132 million of those oh. Tetris copies have been sold since 2010. So whilst we no longer live in a world where everyone knows what Tetris is or everyone has played it, Arguably, more people have played it since the end of Tetris Mania than ever played it during Tetris Mania. So in other words, whilst Pajanov certainly had got the raw end of that complex business history I've just told you about, he ultimately won the day. And I'm sure is very grateful both for your sympathy, Katie, and whatever dollars you have spent on Tetris in your lifetime. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, yes. There it is. He's pulled it out at the end. Oh no! Thank you. That was that was really really good. And it, I didn't know really Tetris was Russian. I didn't know anything about Tetris, so that was all new information ah, to me. Yeah, really? I had no idea. Hmm. That was that was really good. Yeah, there you go. In fact, well, you know, you can add this in later on or not. Um, but that was one for a while. No one wanted to buy the rights to Tetris because they had to be convinced that anyone would buy a Soviet product in the West. Mm, they thought it was too yeah. Russian. Yeah, and uh, so when Spectrum Hollow by they put in all the imagery from the Soviet Union, like city scenes, they put in the Russian folk music. They really leaned into it. Yeah, oh. which I think was the right choice in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had no idea that was the Tetris song was a Russian folk song. So here you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one thing I will say is, I see this a lot on YouTube and things like this because like retro gaming is one of my passions. Is and very understandably, most American YouTubers only see that the history of video gaming through an American right. lens. But if you look at Europe, it's a totally different story, mm -hmm. um, like really fundamentally different in some really key, really key ways. And the things that sort of bind it all together is the same chips that have been used in these systems, but the 
the systems we created or used were really different. So my memories of gaming growing up until the Game Boy come out are really different from most Americans who are the same age as me. Interesting. Um, you use totally different systems. And the ones we used were programmable. So if you bought a Nintendo in the United States, you put in a cartridge, you weren't building games for it yourself or anything. Whereas if you bought you know, a microcomputer in the UK, you were almost certainly learning to code on it as well. You did build your why, video games? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, <laughs> and not only that, the games came on cassette tapes, right? Uh-huh. So even the microcomputers that were sold in the United States, like the Commodore 64 had some success there, but it mainly had success with floppy drives. Yep. Right, you know, like floppy oh, disks. Yes, I, I didn't know anyone who owned a computer with a floppy drive until the 90s. Wow. Everything we had came on mm-hmm. cassettes. It was super cheap, <laughs> um, but it was really slow to load. But it also meant that anyone could develop a game. So if you keep the, cool. if you want to keep this sort of Nintendo centric, if you like, Rare, who were one of the biggest developers on the like the Nintendo sixty four, then they got bought by Microsoft, and they still make games now. They started off as bedroom coders, um, which was a huge scene in Europe because everyone owned these micro computers. They wouldn't, they wouldn't just play the equivalent of Mario; they then go and make it, and then you'd sell it directly because you could you could also make the games yourself on cassette tape. So. Games like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, if Ultima, for example, means anything. I know anything. the name. That's, that's what kind of survived a little bit. Yeah, you know, those sorts of, you know, sort of early role-playing games that were made by one person or very, very, very small teams of people just like, usually just mates in the, who were teenagers working together and would produce like a viable product. Uh, but the pro- the, what's really weird is if you look at like retro gaming in say the UK in the 80s, the games are super weird and idiosyncratic. Oh, and they don't really fit the, the, the bigger picture at all because it's, it's, it's teenage boys who are making them, and British teenage boys with British senses of humour <laughs> rather than, you know, American <laughs> companies who are, or Japanese companies who are producing more sanitised global products. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a really weird Is that history. how Conker's Bad Fur Day got started on the 64? I love it. That's the company that made Conker. Holy shit, right? I love that game. Yeah, yeah. That's the one, right? So, yes. Conquer 64 was created by Rare, but Rare originally existed as a company called Ultimate Play the Game. And Ultimate Play the Game, where I think I think it's two brothers, don't quote me on that, I might be getting my micro developers mixed up. <laughs> we just started coding on their, I'm sure it was the ZX Spectrum, and they produced very basic but very fun yeah. games. And because they were coding on a Z80 processor, they were really, really good and capable of going over to the Game Boy and getting the most out of that system as well. And then they became lead developers on the Super Nintendo and also lead developers on the Nintendo 64. But Conker's Bad Fur Day is much more like a British micro yeah. game in terms of sensibility than practically anything else released wow. after 1996. I mean, when you say it was made by teenage British boys, I was like, oh, like Conker, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, um, 100%. Oh, yeah. Same British school boys just grown up a bit. Yeah, mostly, sort of. Maybe not all that much. There's a giant poo monster in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, they're, they're most With corn ones. for tea. <laughs> so, yeah. I love it. It's amazing. It's a okay. great, great thing. <laughs> Well, no, it's really good that you talked about uh, a little bit of Nintendo and Sega and we got Atari and uh, early video game history, because that's exactly where I'm just going to pass that baton, pick it up, and there we go. <laughs> so so thanks. Thanks, Doc. You can just toss the ball up for me. Spike. <laughs> okay, the year. 1990. Okay, right? Little baby Laurel is sitting in her apartment living room at a leap Mario, well-timed, it's beautiful. Little red leaf floating down from the sky. I catch it. And I turn into a little Mario in a raccoon suit that can fly, (laughs) which doesn't make any sense. But it was so much fun because I love Super Mario Brothers 3. There's your scene (laughs) there. But unbeknownst to little baby Laurel button mashing in her living room, there was a greater war going on. Not one that was in between a mustached uh, plumber and Bowser, King of the Koopas. No, nay, folks. It was one that me and my fellow 80s and 90s kids were a part of, an active part of, active participants. We were both the foot soldiers and the victor's prize. 
It's the great console war between Sega and Nintendo. <laughs> Uh, question. Not to like show my age or anything, but uh, <laughs> is this going to be like the PlayStation and Xbox of my day? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Sorry. Goodness me. But yes, yeah. And that's why I say like console war, but there was um, the name that was given to a few of these little battles that they they had. And yeah, the PlayStation Xbox One would have been one of them. You got it. Got it. I would say though, like the Sega Nintendo one is probably one of the more famous, also like the biggest chapter, I think, in those, those sort of console war- wars there. Um, and the video game industry that today is worth well over 150 billion American dollars oh. with a B, which is greater than both the music and uh, film industries combined. Which is insane. Let that sink in. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I combined? researched all this stuff. Combined. That's from uh, Console Wars, the documentary. That's insane. Do you know how much yeah. money is made through music and film, like alone? Let alone like like a lot. <laughs> Holy crap. A lot. They got video games. Yeah, you actually just blew my Uh, mind. (laughs) But before video games were the money-making titan that it is today, we get to go back to a really cool guy that has come up in a past episode named Ralph Baer. He's frequently called the father of video games. And I talked about him in episode 74, so it's season two, episode three. And he's invented all kinds of things, but he also invented Simon. That was why I talked about him before. And he was a uh, World War II veteran. During the war, he did military intelligence. And then after the war, he was a defense contractor. And he created electronic systems for military applications. And out of that came uh, video game consoles. Interesting. Boom. Early 70s. Here we go. Bear is actually the first to create a commercial video game console called the Magnavox Odyssey in 1972. And at that time, there wasn't like a ton of interest in video games, uh, like you are playing something on your television. There's a little bit of it, but it wasn't like, hey, this will be a really fun thing to do. But Bear really, really believed in it. And he would always talk about the future of video games in in the home. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that decade, so it's September 1977, Atari releases the Atari 2600, and it was a revolution. What do you think? This is going to be like a nerdy thought. There's times where I see like where like if that guy like walked into my house now and I was like, you want to play on the PlayStation or or the Xbox we have here? How blown away would they be at how far everything has come? And then in some instances, mm-hmm. I don't want people to come back and see where it's at. Because I'm like, maybe not so good. Maybe that's <laughs> four or ten years and see where we're at then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something that you believed in. And, and you're at the introduction of Pong, you know, the two little sticks that would go on the side. Like, boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. And for him to be like, this has so much potential This and, and promise. And I think this is something that's going to be so popular in the future. But then to like, yeah, to have him over and be like, Here's the PlayStation 5. Like oh, now, honey, I only have a have 4. I, don't, I can't afford a no, 5, I, but thank you. <laughs> but I see what you're saying. I just try to think of, like, what's the what's the popular one that all the, the kids all are the after. Well, anyway. if you have money, you have the PlayStation 5. <laughs> so the Atari 2600, it came out right at the time when arcade games were starting to become more popular. So like arcades were popping up, right? Like the cool place to be smells like nylon, need quarters. The excitement of being able to play arcade games at home and you can change them out and you don't need quarters. That's so cool. And then companies begin to see, oh, wait, there's something about these video games and home consoles and everyone just tries to jump on that Mm -hmm. ship. There's way too many people in the video game industry and business. Even uh, Purina Pet Food came out with a game, which... Don't, don't, it's fine. We don't need that. No one asked for that. <laughs> what year? No one, no one did. Uh, we're like very early 80s. Okay. Like one, two sort of time. Huh. Market's oversaturated with consoles and a lot of games that were boring. They were glitchy. They were poorly designed. Very little variety because they're ripoffs of each other. Some at were a certain stolen point. from the Russians, apparently. 
<laughs> yeah. Just put that out there. <laughs> and some are just like really awful and offensive and shouldn't exist in the first place, right? So there's so many games. <laughs> yeah, there's some bad ones. And then what seems to be the proverbial nail in the coffin then for Atari and video games in general is it's it, usually the finger <laughs> is pointed at Atari's ET game. Do you know, you know this one, Dr. Darren? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I do. So two really – so essentially by 1982, video games had gotten so bad and there's such a lack of quality control that essentially consumer confidence was shot. And there's two games that are sort of held to blame. The first was Atari's adaptation of Pac-Man and the second oh. was their game based on E.T. I have a copy of Atari's Pac-Man. Oh. Um, it's boxed and unopened and sits on my wall in my work. That's so crazy. Atari's Pac-Man was, it was guaranteed to sell million, millions of copies, but it was of such poor quality that it was you know pretty much hated by most of the kids who got it. <laughs> then E.T. in 1982 becomes this huge hit movie, and Atari spends masses of money buying the rights. It then gives their pro, probably one of their most um, qualified and well-experienced programmers six weeks to build the game from start to finish. And the result is a game that's sort of confusing, doesn't really work, mm -hmm. and was essentially just a big old disappointment. So it sold in the millions, and then it was returned in the millions as well. Mm -hmm. And basically, the immediate aftermath of it is this sales for not just the Atari, but for most of the comparable consoles at the time just plummet. And the market, I don't know what the exact figures were, but say the market plunges from roughly a billion dollars a year to like 200 million or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's this huge video game crash um, as a result of that poor software. Wow. E.T. Well. was terrifying anyway, like though. Like that. <laughs> like, did E.T. not terrify anybody else? <laughs> I hated E.T. as a child. They, it was the 80s. We were fine. <laughs> terrible. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there is the... Uh, video game crash of 1983 everything kind of goes bust even atari is like kind of hanging on by their fingernails and that happens between like 83 to 85 and then september 27th 1986 uh nintendo's uh the nes nintendo entertainment system is released nationwide in america it's an absolute hit everybody loves it it's great i have one of those so nintendo as as you said, Doctor Reed, like Nintendo immediately dominates the scene. They are the name in the home console video game business market. They they are the game in America. To put that in perspective, by 1990, which so like within four to five years after the release of the NES, Nintendo account accounted for at least 90 percent of the United States three billion dollar or 1.8 billion pound video game sector at that time. Woof, right? That's... Yeah, at that time. So it's like by 1990. Wow. So we're going to go back several centuries because, you know, we like to jump in our um, TARDIS, her historical phone booth, our TARDIS. That's why I do. <laughs> <laughs> the, the DeLorean. There we go. Um, so we're going to put a pin in it here. We're going to go back several centuries. So we're going to rewind. Here we go. So back in the 1500s, Portugal made first contact with Japan to begin a trading relationship. And Western playing cards are introduced, which become hugely popular with the Japanese people. Huh. In the early 1600s, though, the Japanese government at the time was like, no, nope, get on out of here. Scram. Gets rid of a lot of foreign products, which included playing cards. But they were so popular. So a lot of people then ended up creating uh, what was called Hanafuda cards, which were flower mm -hmm. cards. They were very similar, but they were like the Japanese take on the Western playing sure. cards. So it was like like our take on it. It's not so Western. But they still got banned anyway a lot of times because they were associated with uh, gambling in the Yakuza. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So there's that. But anyway, it was, let's fast forward a little bit. Later in the 19th century, the government lifts the ban on playing cards. In 1889, a little Hanafuda playing card company opens up in Kyoto. And that little Hanafuda playing card company in Kyoto's name was Nintendo. Uh, so the founder, Yamamuchi, he did this really smart thing by getting in with the casinos because they have to open up a new set of playing cards every yeah. time. Over the decades, Nintendo stays family-owned. 
and then also stays in the gaming business. And in the hands of uh, Minoru Awakawa, Nintendo then expands late 70s, 80s, that sort of time expands over to America. They're like, we're going to get into these video games over here. Nintendo's arcade games weren't great. They, no. <laughs> they, they, yeah, bless. Yes. They, they weren't They weren't at first. Yeah. <laughs> at first. A lot of them were kind of like ripoffs of space games. Okay. And like, they weren't, they're like, eh. So that was kind of where they stood until, until, I feel like he needs like the Chicago Bulls, the 90s Chicago Bulls like um, theme around him. Shigeru Miyamoto. He, in my opinion, in my like nostalgic heart, is is Nintendo. He's I know the guy that name. Yeah, yeah. See, it, like so it's the name everyone's like. Oh. <laughs> He's Mario, right? Like he is who created like a lot of like the big top games from uh, Nintendo. So he comes on the on the scene. He's a game developer, and he starts designing a game for Popeye, as in Popeye the Sailor Man. Toot toot. <laughs> toot toot. Yeah, and he's got this really great game. And in it, um, Popeye would be trying to jump up different platforms and levels to save his dear olive oil from Bluto, who would be like throwing shit at Popeye. <laughs> and everyone's like, this is a fun game. This is going to be great. Except licensing fell through oh, for Popeye. No. Like, we have this game that we love and we like the gameplay. It's, it's really fun. How do we change this around to like make it our own thing? So Bluto became... Donkey Kong, Olive Oil the became the princess, and Popeye became Jumpman oh. or Mario. Oh. Doesn't your heart just want to? It came from Popeye. Popeye don't, cry, don't cry! Don't cry! Don't cry! Don't cry! Don't cry! Don't cry! Yeah, isn't that precious? Oh my gosh! I was like, get out of town. So the Popeye game became Donkey Kong, which is like what launches Nintendo into like good games and. Like that reputation, yeah. right? There's a, another arcade company that's wanting to get into the video game huh, uh, home console scene. Mm -hmm. Get the words out in the 80s. And that company was Sega. <laughs> da -da. In Japan, Sega had created about neck and neck for the most part, had created a home console called the SG-1000, which was released in the same year as Nintendo's early home console, which was the Famicom. Didn't do as well. Yes. It was actually released on the same day. Shut up. <laughs> it was. I mean, <laughs> it was. <laughs> I, I, I promise you, the SG-1000 was released on the same day as the Famicom. I, wow. You will see a lot of people online talk about it as if, like, Sega was like, oh, we're going to release our console on the same day to head off this new competitor. Absolute nonsense. Total Get coincidence. Out of town. On the same day. What? Well, you hear Oh, he knows that. No, no, you should. You should. I, I told you, you retro call. game is one of my passions. I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> but you weren't wrong. I was, you know, Yours is so much facts. cooler, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had something to contribute, so I thought I should. Well, you, you, you did a really magnificent job with the story. Please Cheers. carry on. Cheers. Okay. No, thank you. No, thank you so much for that. I didn't mean to actually tell you to show. That was like a, that was a surprise, like, girl, get out of town. Nice. <laughs> Girl, get out. <laughs> no, thank you. So it's good. Uh, so yeah, so that's cool. They're released on the same day. Holy moly. Sega later tries to compete with um, a 16-bit bit console called the Mega Drive, which came out in Japan. Mm -hmm. But again, didn't do quite as well. Okay. But undeterred, Sega's like, we're going to compete with Nintendo for a share of the US market. We're going to rebrand the Mega Drive to be called the... Sega Genesis. Ah, uh -huh, there it is. And that was released in America in 1989. Now, breaking into the market, let alone being able to even compete, because remember, Nintendo is the giant by this point, to be able to even compete in America's video game market, super difficult. You have to get a store to carry your product in the first place, yeah. give you shelf space. So like people actually can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and no retailer's really going to give you much of a chance when Nintendo is dominating the scene and making everybody a whole lot of money. Yeah. It's like, so why take a chance on something else? <laughs> like, we're good, you know. So Sega needed the tide to turn. Mm -hmm. Turn it around. So enter Tom Kalinske. And now, in my personal opinion, if you care to know my personal opinion on these sorts of things, I like Tom Kalinske. He's a, he's a, he's a cool dude. Like, from what okay. I 
know him. I obviously don't know him personally, but he's one of those people who seems like a great leader. Like everyone says nice things about him and you get the vibe that people that work for him would like just totally go to war for him. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Like, yeah. yeah. He was a likable guy. Yeah. Likable, good leader. And how's this? So for the millennials and younger Gen Xers, you already know and love him as well. He invented the Flintstones children vitamins. Heck yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's such a niche thing to say that anyone my age will be like, yes. In your age, actually, as well. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, you just did it right there. You want to talk about 90s nostalgia? Where my 90s kids at? That's right. (laughs) Listeners, you blow that comment section up because we're my '90s <laughs> Flintstone kids. At we're here. Look at how those. Look at how those vitamins yeah. helped us. Those good old vitamins. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. So he helped invent the Flintstones vitamins, the chew- chewable vitamins. Delicious. But wait, folks, there's still more. He's he's got quite the, the cool resume. For Katie, that was all she needed. That was her seal of approval right there. <laughs> it was cool. I love him. But Katie, you've actually already met him before and studied him once before, but it was a while back. He is like the golden boy of to- toys. He's like the crown prince of toys. So Tom Polinsky yeah. helped revive the Hot Wheels line. He worked for Mattel, <gasps> but yes. he invented He-Man and Masters oh, of the there Universe. there he is. Yeah. Duh. I'm sure. So I have talked about him and I know I talked about him. So Tom Kalinsky. He, he is He Man. By the power the of Grace, go. Yeah, I have the power. That's right. Uh huh. Tom Kalinsky did. He sure had the power. Like yeah. I said, he helped revive the Hot Wheels line that was flagging, you know. And, and mm, he was also the man who made Barbie what she is today. Uh huh. So, because of his success with the Flintstone vitamins, he was brought onto Mattel in 1973. And at that time, Barbie sales were not doing great mm-hmm. at all. And Tom asked Ruth Handler, who was the founder of Mattel, she created the Barbie line and everything. He said, aside from being named after your daughter, you know, what makes Barbie so special? And she says, with Barbie, a girl could be anything she wants to be. And he's like, yeah. hell yeah, I'm taking That's that it. and I'm running with it. And so he completely revitalizes the, the Barbie line and all the accessories and everything. He has these huge accessory lines, all the different occupations that Barbie would have, you know, like the astronaut and doctor and president and like all this stuff. Like he's, he started all of those. I love Um, the like friends, the Corvette, the dream house, all of it, all these things that he's touching. He's like Midas touch, right? Like all these Mm -hmm. things he's, he's touching Mm -hmm. come gold. And he becomes Mattel CEO from 1985 to 1987 until just like you know, weird office politics sort of stuff, pushed him out, drama with the board of directors. And he's like, "Eh, I just don't really like this. I'm out. And he resigns. Lame. So Kalinske, just chilling, vacationing on a beach. He's hanging out with his his family after he's he's like left the company. And Sega's president, Hayao Nakayama, hunts him down. (laughs) <laughs> like he's, good idea finds him like yep. he's liam fucking neeson with the very specific set of skills you know what i mean he's like the japanese <laughs> liam neeson he's like i'm gonna find this guy in his in his business suit on the beach and uh he says i will find you and i will <laughs> employ you <laughs> and that's how kind of how it was he's like i've got a product that's really cool and everyone's gonna love it and you really need to see it because we need somebody to like take it and run. And uh, so Tom Kalinsky's like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll go back. I'll check it out. Right. So uh, he takes the job at Sega as Sega of, Sega of America CEO. Kalinsky, like he doesn't really know much about video games. Mattel did like some little handheld toys, yeah. you know, but I know, I know toys and I, I'm good at this sort of thing. <laughs> Don't worry. I was going to ask, what is he going to do it. to a video game industry? What is what isn't he going to do is going to be Come the on. question, really. That's this is the creator of He-Man we're talking yes. about. Come on now, <laughs> yeah. He's He-Man. He's Barbie. He is Flintstones vitamins. Fuck yeah, yes. <laughs> is the crown prince of toys. Those things Tom slapped so hard. Like if they brought so a candy back of it, I would say just take my money because I want it, and it has that weird irony taste afterwards. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the weird <laughs> thing. All, 
It's on my 90s nostalgia page. And someone's like, do you ever just think about the Flintstones vitamins? It's like, who doesn't? I can taste them right now. Yes. Belinsky <laughs> takes the job as Seika of America's CEO under the agreement, Mr. Yakiyama, that I am allowed to do what I need to do to get Sega Genesis on its feet and can be able to compete with Nintendo. Don't make me jump through hoops. Don't like red tape me. His, his thing in an interview is he says like, I know that uh, companies, Japanese companies that became multinational that were run outside of Japan, they were a lot stricter with those companies because they're a satellite, right? They're a little bit further okay. out of reach. And so he said, I don't want to be restricted in, and what I know that I need to do. So let me, just let me do it. I got to do it like the American way, quote unquote, you know. Uh, I feel like it's worth noting now while we're talking about it, that Nakayama, who is the Sega president and then also the CEO over at um, Sega of Japan, SOJ. Okay. He's described by everyone, basically, in any interview I saw as domineering, scary, hard to please, Um Oh, yeah. That's lovely. Hard work. Take that information. Sorry. And uh, you're just going to just put that in your back pocket. Hold on to that. Okay. Hey, welcome to the Midway Point. I know I've never stopped you in the middle of a story before, so I'm sorry about that. But it's kind of hard to find a Midway Point when there's three stories and mine is always particularly long. So here's the literal Midway Point. Thanks for being here, really. We are so glad to be back for another season here with you. Would you really just wanna say thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up. Whether this is the first time listening, thanks for giving us a chance, or you've listened to every single episode from practically day one. Thank you so much for all the time that you give us and all the support. And we're going into season three, and I was just thinking before I started recording this that this is actually going to be our third year doing Hightailing Through History. Uh, we're rapidly approaching the three-year anniversary. And we love doing this so much and are so passionate about it. It's uh, For me, it's practically a, a full-time job. I do it because I love it. I love being here and I love learning and sharing what I learn with you. So I've decided that I'm gonna do something that I'm really bad at doing and just ask for your support. And that can mean a lot of different things. There are a lot of amazing ways that you could support us for free because we really are a tiny show. And if we could just get our audience to grow, that would be huge support right there. Like sharing any of our social media posts. We are on Instagram at Hightailing History or on TikTok at Hightailing History Pod. Like this video to comment on it if you're watching on a platform that allows you to do so, like YouTube. Leaving a star review, those are really quick and easy to do. Or if you have a little more time, writing out a review on the platform that you're listening on. That's huge. Sharing our show with a friend or an episode that you're listening to, we would greatly appreciate that. If you if you can think to take the time to do that, it would mean so much for us. We also now have a Patreon. We call it the Best Buds Club. <laughs> so if you want to support us in a financial way, we'd be thrilled. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash hightailing through history or search hightailing through history at Patreon's search bar. Over there, we have what we call our half-baked episodes, which are shorter episodes that we do. We have our history munchies, which are different historical cooking or history lessons while we cook something. For this episode, I will be putting out one about ramen noodles. Bonus materials such as interviews with our guests and behind the scenes content. And then we'll have merch one day. We're going to have some discounts on merch as well, too. That's patreon.com forward slash hightailing through history. All of our social media and Patreon are directly linked in the show notes below. Thanks for sticking with me through that. We're so glad you're here. Now let's get back to the show and on with part two. Nintendo, Sega, fight. As I <laughs> mentioned, Nintendo is overwhelmingly dominating the market. They're mm -hmm. huge. Nintendo is video games. But they're a little cocky about it. In order to rebuild after that crash in 83, they took a lot of steps to rebuild the industry, put some trust back into it again, uh, have better quality games. So they had like their seal of approval on things to show this is a Nintendo approved game. I remember and it. We're going to do it. It was yeah. a red one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was gold. Sometimes gold. That's right. <laughs> and uh, they had uh, a 
like a lockout technology. So that way people can put unauthorized games on their systems. They also had um, publications, Nintendo Power. That was like a whole thing. And also like a hotline over time. These things are over time. But like Mm -hmm. they also had this hotline where like if you're playing Legend of Zelda and you're like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go here. (laughs) Yeah. You call somebody and there's like a nerdo at the end of the the line with this little thing. yeah. And he'd be like, hang on, wait. I gotta do this in full. They're like, hello, this is uh, Nintendo. And yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Could you even imagine? Like, yeah. bro, call the hotline. We're stuck, man. So they, but they had this hotline. So if you got stuck in a game, you could call somebody and they would be able to to help you out. And so it like made uh, Nintendo I just very use trusted. YouTube name. now, but yeah, yeah that's uh, super handy. <laughs> all right. Uh, on top of that, though, they bullied computer software developers to create only for Nintendo. Oh, good. Yeah, that's, that's nice, lovely. right? And also to kind of uh, strong arm retailers into only carrying Nintendo products. So they got in trouble with um, with the law. <laughs> you know, people were saying, like, this isn't fair. You're effectively running a monopoly here. Yeah, with monopolizing the, video game. the market. Yeah. So one would say, uh, I would say, because I wrote it on my paper here, the Hanafuda <laughs> card deck was stacked in Nintendo's favor. So, <laughs> so lame. So, so lame. It's okay. I'm going to laugh for you. Thank you. We're here to support each other. So, so this fact of, of Nintendo's dominance was overwhelmingly made clear to Tom Kalinske when he became Sega of America's CEO and attended his first electronics trade show. Mm-hmm. World of Nintendo. It's like a globe. Music. Mm, mm, mm. It was a party. Everyone was going to Nintendo. It's, it was it's, insane. It's, it's, it's. Ah. <laughs> and there's a little Sega in the corner. But oh. Oh. he goes back to <laughs> he goes back to his hotel room later to have a sleep. And as he's watching a little bit of TV, there's a Reebok commercial that he sees. And um, it's two men standing at the edge of a of a bridge. They're about to bungee jump. One man is wearing Nike Airs. The other man is wearing Reebok pumps, which is this stupid fucking they shoe. Pumped, right? So stupid. Yeah, I remember these. I've he seen leans down, goes, the commercial. <laughs> he put he pumps his shoes up a couple times, and they're like, and they jump. And <laughs> at the end of it, matey with the uh, uh, Reebok shoes, he's like still like hanging, and he's just like, da da, I've completed my bungee jump. And it looks over and the other guy in the Nike Airs, uh, the shoes are still there in the bungee, but not <laughs> the man. So oh, my. It's, a very, it's a very controversial head. Or it was like, Damn. <laughs> very effective marketing. Effective, right. <laughs> yeah. Klinsky's like, this is how we're going to change the game. This is how we go against Nintendo. Does he come up with a master plan? He's got a master plan, right? He yes. says... Let Nintendo have the kids. We're going to go after the older teens, the college students, the adults, that kind of stuff. We're going to have a little bit of edge and attitude. And we also need ourselves a funny little guy to go up against Mario. Sonic the Hedgehog comes Uh out of a contest that they had over at SOJ, Sega of Japan. And originally, (laughs) Sonic was like really mean looking. He had like claws, a spiked collar. He had a band. He had this girlfriend named Madonna who was like Jessica rabbit levels of sexy and voluptuous, like, but she was human too. So that was also interesting. Yeah. She likes short kind of blonde, choppy hair, red dress shaped like this. Okay. (laughs) Got it. So So that's Madonna. That was Sonic's girlfriend. So Sega made Sonic. He's dating Madonna. Yeah. He has a band. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sega of America encouraged a cleaner version of Sonic. And uh, that ends up being the one that we all know and love. Right. Yeah. Tom Kalinske, with all of his ideas, he goes to SOJ for his big meeting with Nakayama and the board of directors. This is what needs to be done. Sega Genesis needs to be at a a lower price. We're going to make a game for Sonic that's going to come bundled with the system, like how Super Mario Brothers was with NES, that whole thing. They already had a game called Alter Beast that came with the system, but they're like, eh, that's not as much fun. It doesn't have as much like long time playability. Sonic the Hedgehog's where we need to go. Kalinsky also wanted to get licensing with American pop culture brands and movies um, that hit the older, trendier share of the market, more sports games. So let's partner up with EA, uh, Electronic Arts. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to take on Nintendo. Ta-da. The board of directors are just staring back at him and they are not happy. 
they Ooh. they're furious. Like they are so pissed. But Nakayama, even though he's really mirrored, he leaves the meeting and says, I hired you on to to do what you need to do, and I told you I was gonna let you do it, so do it, but it better be good, kind of thing. Uh-huh. So Sonic the Hedgehog gets developed. Gameplay is fast. It's so fast. It's totally next level. You can go up, you can go down. It's you can, like zing from one thing to the next. And they do a mall tour to get that teen mall crowd. They go to these American malls on a mall tour all summer. And the kids are testing it out. And the kids are like, this is so cool. Look how fast this is. I love Sonic. This is so like Sonic is insanely fast. In your face. Actually, that's why I couldn't yeah. play it. <laughs> it's too slow. I died all the time. I was like, I suck at this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I tried playing it recently and I'm like, this is so much harder than I remember this being as a kid. I can't oh, remember how to like get him to stay in place and spin. I was like, what button is that? Is it down an eight? Down? Call the hotline. Yeah. Oh, this is Sega. They didn't have a hotline. <laughs> well, that was a feature introduced in Sonic 2. So that's why you're struggling to do it. <laughs> listen, this group chat's going to be blowing up. I'm going to be like, listen, I'm I stuck in this part in this game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The movie you're referring to is The Spin Dash in that game of Sonic 2, and everyone who picks up Sonic the Hedgehog from their youth can figure out how to do it because it wasn't in that game. Oh my <laughs> gosh, thank you. Thank you. You know what? That makes me feel so much better because I was like, I feel like my muscles in my fingers were telling me this is how this is supposed to go, and I couldn't get it. I think your video game hotline just became that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So. Sega has to go after the, the retailers now, right? And they're like, we're going to go top down. We're not starting with small stores. We're going to go right for the big dog. We're going for Walmart. So they have a meeting with Walmart to try and get in. And Walmart's like, no, we're already good with Nintendo. Thank you so much. But no, Sega. As Kalinske, uh, like as the team are leaving uh, headquarters, Walmart headquarters, there's retail space across the street from Walmart. And they're like, Oh my gosh, we're going to turn this place into uh, like a little try uh Genesis for free storefront kind of thing. We didn't, we're not going to sell anything, but people can come oh. and they can play. We're going to put it right across the street from Walmart, which ended up actually becoming popular with the Walmart employees. <laughs> I bet it yeah, did. Yeah, huge lines. <laughs> and it got the kids coming in too, right? And then all the billboards along the highway, they're like, Sega, 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 Sega. Boom, 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 boom. So smart. I love it. So that does well. Their mall tour is doing well. And Sega does these sort of like, I don't know, I guess you'd call it grassroots marketing tactics. And it gets them in the door because they've created buzz now. Sega's edgy. They're cool. Um, they made fun of Nintendo. They made Nintendo like the uncool choice to, to like and have. They developed the, uh, it was the Welcome to the Next Level marketing campaign, which is like really, uh, it was kind of like the grunge scene and in your face and and loud and all that. And they had the Sega scream. Hey, do you remember that? They go, Sega, like that in the commercials. That was a really bad mm. impression. But anyway. The Sega scream. It's just part of their their marketing campaign that they yeah. they did. It like became like a thing that remember kids doing. Kalinsky and the Sega of America team, they rolled out all these changes before Nintendo's big release for their Super NES, uh, which came out in September uh, 1991. And it it worked. Like over time, the fact that Sega was able to hold their own against Goliath, aka Nintendo, proved to everyone that Sega really had something for the gamers and it influenced retailers to get on board open up more space for Sega products. And, and this is a big one, I think, it got the third-party game developers on board. So a lot of them broke their exclusive agreements that they had with Nintendo. Wow. And also work with Sega. So Konami, Capcom, Acclaim, Tecmo. Due to the success of Street Fighter II, <laughs> uh, the fighting game genre really grew. And in 1993, a little game from developer Midway was really successful at the arcade because of how violent it was. And that's Mortal Kombat. Yes, there it is. There it is. I love Mortal Kombat. <laughs> but because of its popularity in the arcades, uh, Nintendo and Sega both were like, we want to get it on our home consoles. Like, we, we yeah. need to get this game. But the violence. Like, eh. Now, Nintendo. <laughs> that was the point of Mortal Kombat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
But Nintendo, they were like, we're going to censor the content a little bit. We're going to take out the fatalities that everyone had. You know, like Kano could rip somebody's heart out. And, Fatality. Yeah, rip a spine out, that kind of, kind of thing. Right, because they're, the they're like fleshy corpse crumples to the ground. That's how I uh, feel victory. That. Long day at work, I'm going to tell you nothing relieves stress like a little bit of Mortal Kombat. <laughs> So Nintendo's like, we're going to change the the color codes on this. And it's, I always remember it being like green blood. So like, like you'd punch and like, like a little green spray Mm -hmm. would go. Um, But I was also seeing a lot of my sources that it was sweat. So I don't know if there's certain places where they made it look like sweat and like blood. I'm not sure, but I just remember the green blood. Editing Laurel here. So I got a little more clarification about that. It seems that both Nintendo and Sega did not have blood, but with the Game Genie, there was a blood code that you could work around for the Sega Genesis. And the Sega Genesis allowed for the color codes of the sweat to be changed back to red, and therefore we got blood in the Sega Genesis game. The point being that they did, they changed the color. There's no, there's no blood mm-hmm. in the Nintendo game, right? Uh, whereas Sega did not do that. <laughs> They're like, nah, let them... <laughs> Let them, uh, well, you said their market was older, so yeah, and that was their whole thing. Like this is this is what we're going for. So I mean, Mortal Kombat came out in '93. Doom also came out in '93. I feel like a lot of people these days would kind of like laugh at the pixelated violence that's <laughs> in those sorts of games yeah. at the time, those early ones. But uh, I remember, like, I certainly wasn't allowed to play them. I did I did do that. Did you? So naughty. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell my mom. Yeah, but it was violent. It was kind of like a shocking thing. And in news segments at the time, they'd be like, these are the violence of video games. And the, the, the kids would be like, I like playing the games that have violence in them. And I like the blood and, and stuff like that. And the parents were like clutching their pearls. And, you know, <laughs> so there's a combination of violent video games, along with like some other moral panics of the of the early 90s. You know, we've got uh, the war on drugs going on. Yeah. A lot of times video games were talked about as like addicting or like being peddled yep. and pushed to kids. Like or drugs, that they you know? created violence. That was a big one. I, I also think there's like a little bit of holdover from this satanic panic of the late 80s too. Like just like because a lot mm-hmm. of these games, like especially with Mortal Kombat, there was like a sorcery sort of thing there too. Mm-hmm. So Congress gets involved, right? Like people are a little upset. Congress <laughs> gets involved and there's a series yeah. of congressional hearings between Sega and Nintendo. Lord of mercy. Yeah. Okay. And the two biggest <laughs> games that were at like the heart of it all is Mortal Kombat was the big one, but then Sega also, which had all the violence right on the on the Sega console. But there's also another game that only Sega released called Night Trap. It was kind of like a it's like an interactive movie. It was kind of played out to me like a like an eighties like B horror movie, you know, like, okay, girl, like a teenage game. girls slumber party weird thing. Anyway, yeah. so they were like, we don't like this, and we got to talk about it. Yeah. So what's interesting to me is Bill White, who was a executive over at Nintendo, he feels like Nintendo's maybe been rusting on their laurels a little bit too much. Um, He's like, Sega's got a good thing going. I'm going to jump ship, head over to Sega. And then he became Sega's senior vice president. So they put Bill White into this congressional hearing with Howard Lincoln, who was senior vice president at Nintendo. Right. So like just, just a bit of tea for you. But uh, it's the and the shade. <laughs> the and the shade. Uh, so and Nintendo takes a stance of like, well, Mr. Senator, Mr. Senator Lieberman, Joe Lieberman, uh, we curate the games that we have at Nintendo, and we specifically don't have the violence in our games or try and curb it out and censor it, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, Sega, who has, getting, has already gone into the hearing looking like already like a little bit as a bad guy or like, we market our products to an older crowd. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. our, our stance. And we also have been developing this rating systems that we're trying to get the rest of the industry to use so that we people buying the games are more informed. And yeah. Nintendo, they have violence. It's like here, wait, look, here's this gun that they developed for their shooter game. It ends with them basically being like, you guys figure it out or we'll figure it out for you. So the video game industry in early 1994 had taken up this uh, what a great year. <laughs> system, which is the Entertainment Software Rating Board, which we still have today on everything. 1994, here we go. This is where some cracks are going to start to happen. 94, Nintendo shows up at it with a, a cheesy Safari theme for their electronic show, and they fake shoot uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, and they say, like, I know, and they say, we're going to allow the violence. What? 
in Mortal Kombat 2. We're going to open ourselves up to some more mature content. And they take a page from Sega's playbook and they have the whole Play It Loud marketing campaign, which was like the grungy rock and roll scene. Sega, on the other hand, they're like, okay, what's our next level? What are we going to do? And this is where the cracks between SOA and SOJ like really start to show. So Sony really wants to get into the video game business. Hey, Sega, Sony, maybe we should do something together and call it a Sony PlayStation. There was actually a secret deal that happened where they were going to have like this joint hardware, but they would make their own money off the software. Could you imagine? It was like this close. Holy like we very nearly had the Sega PlayStation. Could you even imagine like... That would have been wild, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like in a good way. Yeah, it would have been really cool. Uh, But there was uh, the engineers and the developers at Sega of Japan were like, no, we're like, we can't really agree on the specs. Mm -hmm. And so that fell through. And Tom was like, I don't feel like they tried hard enough. Like, I feel like it was just starting to be like a butting heads sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was so close. So Sega starts developing something called the Sega Saturn. But it didn't have the hardware yet. So like they they didn't have the 32 bits, but they're like, we are talking to this company called Silicon Graphics, who in 1994, like were part of you know, movie magic. Around the time that you were born, Katie, movies had a nice little. <laughs> oh, I know. October of 94 was a big month. <laughs> there was, um, oh, there's Jurassic Park. There was uh, Pulp Forest Fiction, Gump. Lion King. <laughs> there was. <laughs> No, oh, I sorry. Didn't. I got excited. <laughs> Great movies. Yes. But just in terms of like the, the technology behind them, like the graphics, yeah. and everything, the mask, right? Forrest Gump, you know, to, in order to like edit him in with Kennedy and things like that. Uh, the Crow even. So like had to yeah. edit back in Brandon Lee afterwards. Like, yes. So these were mm-hmm. all like new technology that was on the scene and they had nearly had a deal with Silicon Graphics. And then- <sighs> They're also told no by Sega of Japan, which is really surprising because the whole thing was like, hey, when I can't come on board, I don't want to be red taped and have to jump through a bunch of hoops. Like, have, right. I have, I know what we need to do to stay competitive and that's mm-hmm. not happening now. And so Sega does not partner with Silicon Graphics, but a little bit of time later, Nintendo does and they leapfrog right to a 64 system, the Nintendo 64. So 1995, the big electronics show, they call it 3E, Nakayama from Sega of Japan. The hardware, software, like the Sega Saturn was not ready yet, but Mm -hmm. Sony is now going into their own development. They're like, fine, Sega, if you're not going to do the PlayStation with us, we're going to do it on our own. They get a guy from Sega to come join their team. Now that's a whole like little three-way war. It's a problem. (laughs) (laughs) Sony's coming in at the electronics show. Sony comes up to the stage. This is the PlayStation. This is what it's going to look like. How much is it going to be? Two ninety nine. Practically, Mike drops out two ninety nine for the debut of the Sony PlayStation, which was much cheaper and had much cooler <laughs> gameplay than PlayStation otherwise. was three hundred dollars when it first came. <laughs> so it's always been expensive. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even then, it was less than the competitors. So everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, this wow. is going to be cool." CDs was cool, you know, versus the cartridge because again, it allows for better, uh, like longer games and graphics. It does, and all that but they stuff. don't last as long, do they? <laughs> anyway, so it's like practically boom, mic drop, Sony PlayStation, everyone loses their minds. April 9th, 1995, the Sony PlayStation is released in North America. Woo! <laughs> Sega Saturn sold less than 10 million units. They Oof. had to put Two, in order to try and compete with the Nintendo 64, um, they put two 32-bit uh, chips in there. This is where I'm going to sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they put two 32-bit <laughs> chips in there to try and make it 64, but it ended up making the developing and coding process for everything else very challenging. So they didn't have enough games and like it just it was a mess, basically. It was a, yeah. a problem. But Nakayama wanted an immediate push for that to be released because of the PlayStation coming out and, and all that. So, uh oh, everybody. <laughs> so, Sega Saturn sells less than 10 million units. The Nintendo 64 sold 30 million. And the PlayStation wow. sold over 100 million units. 
yeah. second <laughs> only to its sequel, the PlayStation 2, which remains the highest video game console. Sure is. Of all time. Also the best. But anyway. Mm -hmm. And also having that CD being CD based as well too helped push their sales because again, they could get better games, but they won mm -hmm. the contract with uh, Squaresoft, who. Oh. Final Fantasy, that entire huge yeah. series. And then Final Fantasy <sighs> 7. Ah, I know. That <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous game, Final Fantasy 7, helped push sales to that because like, it was such a popular game. Final Fantasy 7 was with Cloud, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the one that everybody likes. 7 and 8 are like my favorites. I know 8 was your favorite with Squall. <laughs> I just liked that Me 7 out. had... Oh my goodness. <laughs> Me, yeah. That scar on his face, goodness gracious. Oh my goodness. He looked like the lead singer from AHA. Uh -huh. <laughs> he totally does. It's so funny. What were we talking about? Oh, Final, yeah, Final so. Fantasy. <laughs> and the PlayStation. And the PlayStation. So the, the war, air quotes there, effectively ends between Sega and Nintendo. Fortunately, Sega had a big L with the Sega Saturn. Tom Kalinske resigned from Sega in 1996 and went on to work at LeapFrog, the educational toy. <gasps> Oh, okay. I, know. I love the way you No, he just like, yeah, he just keeps it on going with that one hit after another. Boom, boom, boom. Tom Kalinske. That dude's got folks. gold, man. Mm. He knows what's up. Sega has one last push with a sixth, sixth generation console that preceded, but was very soon up against Sony's PS2. So like, good, good luck. luck. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo's GameCube and the Xbox. Oh, And that was called wrecked. the Sega Dreamcast. It was yeah. the first home console that came with a modem. So Sega was already looking ahead to online gaming, which is like yeah. what gaming mostly is, well, in a lot of ways is now. I remember that, yeah. So they had a modem that came with it, and that was the first console to do that. Uh, came out in 99, discontinued in 2001, and then Sega leaves home consoles and changes its focus to development of software and licensing. But you know, not, Nintendo still very much exists. But uh, yeah, well, the in new 1996, war. Nintendo had a massive cash crop of Pokemon. Yeah. So yeah, Nintendo's not going anywhere. Yeah, they did fine. They did fine. But uh, then the war ended up going between uh, Xbox and PlayStation, of course. But PlayStation's just recently beat that one out officially. Uh, yeah, Xbox or Microsoft is like, you win, Uncle. I'll say. Microsoft isn't making Xbox. No, I, there's, I think. Still are, oh. but they're like, we're not going to try and go compete with Sony. Yeah. So there we go. So the, the uh, war between Sega and Nintendo, Sega versus Nintendo. Nobody won. Sony won. So there. Yeah. All right. That was awesome. Thank you, Laurel. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So really long. That was very nostalgic and exciting for me. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it did too. Thank you. I would so I highly recommend. So I read a couple of supplementary articles, but I watched um, a documentary called Console Wars, which was directed by Blake Harris, who wrote the book, which took me an obscenely long time to realize it was the same person did both. <laughs> uh, I read the book, well, most of the book of the same name, Console War by Blake Harris. The book is very nearly about the same thickness as my paperback copy of Dune that I have next to me. So <laughs> didn't get through all of it, but it was a pretty good, pretty, pretty good book. It, um, it, the biggest criticisms people had was like the dialogue is a lot of the dialogue was made up and extrapolated based off like of interviews and stuff like that. But the yeah. author says that like right off the bat in the beginning. So, okay. I mean, as long as you're not taking each and every single word of dialogue for gospel, then, you know, whatever. Yeah. but uh, but it's good. And I really love the documentary. Documentary is very good, which you can find on Paramount Plus if you're in America currently. So, boom. Yeah. Loved it. Good stuff. Listen, this is about to get super fun, y'all. Are mm -hmm. we ready? We're going to head back to nothing at all to do with it, what any of y'all are talking about. All right, We're going to go straight back to the ancient civilizations a little bit of a topic that by the time this comes out, it won't be here, but I had to do it because like, yeah, uh, it's going to be a bit of an obvious topic for those of us here. This is being recorded before the 19th, uh, but I was perusing the interwebs and I found a little bit of more information on the topic that, that I didn't know about. Right. So what I assumed to be correct was also not totally true. So I'm going to share it with all of you because I love finding out that I'm wrong. It makes it, <laughs> 
<laughs> two tens is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So you probably guessed it because you two are very clever people. Uh, we're talking about solar eclipses. There it is. Oh, okay. And how ancient civilizations experienced, understood, and interacted with them. The spark noted version, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, it is. So it comes as no surprise, I'm going to guess, to you, well, definitely to you guys, but also to listeners, that eclipses were often seen as bad omens, which is how I kind of assumed, like, if you asked me, oh, Katie, what do you know about ancient civilizations and, like, eclipses? I'd be like, probably not good, dude. <laughs> and that would be my basic answer to you. So, and, like, uh, one uh, astronomer over at Louisiana State University he said, imagine that you're a farmer, you're just out here, and all of a sudden the sky goes dark. He goes, probably not good. I was like, that's what I would think. I'd be like, holy shit, what's happening, man? You'd be so, a little nervous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a little, you'd be like, what the? <laughs> uh, he said, it, you know, because a lot of times it would be read as a message from the gods, right? Uh, to our ancestors, an eclipse, it looks uh, uh, that, that ominousness, right? The sun and the moon are tiff typically, not always, but oftentimes the uh, chief gods of the Pantheon were modeled after them. So when the sun's dying in front of your eyes, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, probably, dude, probably. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's such a strange darkness too. Like if it, when it's in yeah. totality, it's like you have sunglasses on, but it's like sunny and it's like. It, it's weird. Oh, you're yeah. looking around, you're like, wow, what's sky going dark, yeah. dude? Yeah, it's dark. And you're like, oh, it's okay again. We're all right. Of so course. in Mesopotamia, the region that today would have Iraq, Syria, Kuwait. Uh, it says Turkey, but I never say Turkey right anymore. Laurel, how's it go? Oh God, don't do that to me. Um, <laughs> Tur Turkey? Yeah. Turkey? Something like yeah, that? Is that right. yeah. roughly? I believe you're Ooh. right because you I'll corrected correct me on me. it. So even in ancient Mesopotamia, astronomers were looking for explanations, right? So they started keeping uh, detailed records of the celestial movement. So the people of Mesopotamia, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, were the first to figure out that eclipses occur in cycles. Uh, meaning that they could then predict when they will next happen, right? That was kind of a big deal. It wasn't just this, oh my God, the sky is turning dark, the sky is falling, the gods are going to eat us all. Right. There you go. I included a couple excerpts from a professor at Yale University. His name is Eckert. It's either Fram or Fromm, like the oil company for cars. Uh oh. I believe it's Fram. Okay. So he talks about how in Mesopotamia, uh, they have a lot of leftover text because they wrote it on clay as opposed to like wood or shit that just doesn't and just disintegrates in time, right? Yeah. Problem. He talks about how not every text that they found necessarily, this is going to sound really stupid, but like said the same thing. Because like what I told you, my predetermined notion on this was, oh, it's always a bad thing, right? Mm. Sky's turning black, shit's going down. He said that's what you would call an omen text. Uh, there's collections of entries, uh, like if a solar eclipse happens in the first month of the year, that the king will die and there will be famine. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, that sucks. Uh, we also have letters that they uh, were studying with this between Assyrian kings of that time, uh, between the kings and the scholars and astronomers, right? Like, Listen, bro, I'd really like to not die. Like, can you, like, tell me what's up, you know? So, oh, no. In, indeed. I'd like to know if that's going to happen or not. <laughs> At that time, some discerning kings were much more interested in the astrology of it, which actually shocked me. I guess it shouldn't because that's kind of a stupid thing to say, right? I shouldn't give our ancestors such little credit because we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. <laughs> so pretty clever. They've done a lot, invented the wheel, all that good stuff. <laughs> The kings stationed scholars all over the kingdom in different cities to observe the sky and write on them on a daily basis. So it became this big research project. And this is in Mesopotamia, by the way. I haven't moved on from there. We're still stuck there. And that's how, in, at this time, in this portion of the world, the ancients kind of kept track of the skies. Professor Framp, when he was asked how they would have kept track of the skies. He said they don't have telescopes, obviously. Uh, so they just 
observe the sky. They just looked at the freaking sky, <laughs> man. That's what they did. They looked up. And even with your bare eye, when you look consistently and you record everything that happens, you kind of get an idea of the mechanics of it, right? That's how the wayfinders watched the constellations. It's how they were able to navigate the insanely perilous Pacific Ocean, uh, which is a terrifying notion to me, but they're a lot braver than I am. So you're going to get an idea of like reoccurring events. And in Babylonia, in the 8th century, leading up to the 1st century, BCE to be specific because we are around <laughs> here. <laughs> he said it was the, he says it's essentially the longest research project of all time. So they recorded every eclipse, the movement of the moons and the planets and correlated it in some extent to events in history. And they had, uh, they observed a big, what would you, phenomena? They observed a lot of phenomena mm -hmm. that enabled them to establish these regularities with comets, with planet movements, eclipses. And that led to the refinement of mathematical astronomy. This is a big deal, right? Yep. During the last few centuries before Christ came into Mesopotamia. Mathematical astronomy. How important. <laughs> also, sounds way beyond what I would I be doing. Say, I like, like, I'm that's out. a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> Sitting there and measuring shit. Mm -mm -mm. I actually, yeah, I wish I was that cool. I am not. Yeah, I very, very, very briefly in my astronomy class learned a very teeny tiny little bit of it. Easily, I will say, actually, one of my more favorite classes I oh. took. I really liked that one. Also, little fun fact to stick on to the end of Mesopotamia here the Greeks drew upon that research from mm -hmm. Mesopotamia. Yep. And go. I'm going to mispronounce this, so everybody just <laughs> buckle in and bear with me. The famous Antikythera mechanism? Is that how it's said? I highly <laughs> doubt it. I like how Anti we both like our eyes shift to the historian in the I know, we're, we're both like, like he uh, probably knows what it's <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Very gently suggest that I don't know how it's pronounced either, so you're okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> we're ignorance together. <laughs> Oh, cool. So my best bet, Antikythera mechanism. There it is. Okay. It's an ancient computer. What? We all computers. We all hit the same. That was our connecting point uh, from the Hellenistic period. Actually, had settings. Are you? Can you even fucking believe this? It's an Avatar: <laughs> The Last Airbender. For those of you that want to know, it's the thing they go into the library and move it around. It's how they predict the solar eclipse and the day of black sun when they invade the Fire Nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> highly recommend it to anybody. It's good writing in that show. Uh -huh. So it actually was enabled. This is gonna blow your mind. Okay. Blow the it. prediction of solar and lunar eclipses is based on the Babylonian models. If you've seen it. <laughs> There's this big room they walk into, like a big astronomy room. Okay. would be kind of a stupid, but there's all these mechanics and there's this big representation of the sun and the moon and you can move them by okay. moving mechanisms. Mm -hmm. There that's are Indiana how... Jones in my mind right now. But I, yeah! I'm not, yeah, no, that's perfect. That's kind of what this would have looked like, okay. which is so fucking cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so without scientific explanation, the darkening of the sun or moon uh, during an eclipse would be a really startling event. Duh. Uh, throughout history, eclipses have been seen as a disruption of natural order or eye problems. And many groups have believed them to be bad omens. Many ancient people even have spiritual explanations for the solar and lunar eclipses to help them make sense of this random phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to go over this last bit. It's just a couple of different civilizations that we picked out to, because basically what it comes down to is we have existing info from them. So this is what we know about what they would have experienced. Because like, like I said, people who wrote stuff down in wood, sorry, we don't know. It's not around. So in ancient okay. China, it was commonly held that solar eclipses occurred when a celestial dragon attacked and like devoured that. the sun. Mm -hmm. The Chinese eclipse records are some of the oldest in the world. They go back more than 4,000 years. And one, <laughs> sorry, this is really funny. It simply states, the sun has been eaten. That's that's the record for the day, the sun has been eaten. That's, that's the sentence right there. Oh. I was like, oh shit. 
Oh, so to wow. frighten away the dragon and save the sun, because we got to do that, people would bang drums and make loud noises during an eclipse since the sun would always return after the ruckus. It was easy to see that this tradition stuck around, right? Yeah, it I seems love it. that the is that great? Yeah. It seems that the ancient Chinese were not particularly bothered by lunar eclipses, however. One text from 90 BCE dismisses them as a common matter. Now, I read in one of my sources that they said a lunar eclipse, and so they always come two weeks apart. In India, the ancient Hindu mythology provides a rather graphic and disturbing explanation for these eclipses. Are you ready? This one gets yeah. wild. Yes. So according to the legend, a cunning dragon named Rahu sought to drink the nectar of the gods and attain immortality. Who fucking doesn't? Mm-hmm. I would have. <laughs> Disguised as a woman, Rahu attempted to attend a banquet of the gods mm-hmm. and was discovered by Vishnu. As punishment, the demon was promptly beheaded. Oh, and his decapitated head was sent flying across the sky and darkened the sun during the eclipse. What a ride. Oh, yeah. I know. Love Some that. versions say that Rahu was actually able to steal the sip of the nectar before being beheaded and the elixir before it reached the rest of his body and his immortal head is in perpetual pursuit of the sun and sometimes catches and swallows it, but the sun quickly reappears as Ryu has no throat. Oh, the fuck not. Awesome. I heard that and I was like, that's sick. <laughs> I'm living, I'm living for it. That's, that's so cool. I was like, oh, I'm really loving it. And then it, like the last line hit me and I had to like replay yeah, that a couple like, times oh my. in my head. And I was like, yeah, that would make so much sense. So, okay. <laughs> Magic. Oh, I love that. Okay. Thank Indeed. You. We're going to, Mm. Head more into probably more familiar territory in ancient Mesoamerica. Uh, the Inca of South America worshipped Inti, <laughs> the all-powerful sun god. Inti was generally believed to be benevolent, but solar eclipses were understood to be a sign of his wrath and displeasure. It has to be wrath, okay? You can't describe a god being angry without being mm. wrath because it's bad. Following an eclipse, spiritual leaders would attempt to divine the source of his anger and determine which sacrifices could be offered. Although the Inca rarely practiced human sacrifice, it is thought that an eclipse was occasionally deemed serious enough to do so. Fasting, it says, was also common, and the emperor would often withdraw from public duties following an eclipse. In North America, uh, there are a couple different takes via the First Nations up here uh, with their own legends on such events. According to Choctaw legend, a mischievous black squirrel, this one's actually really fun. A mischievous black squirrel is gnawing on the sun and is the cause of the eclipses. So like the Chinese dragon, the squirrel needs to be frightened away by the clamor and yells of the human witnesses. So adorable, right? The a Ojibwe, black squirrel that lives in our neighborhood. and he, He's like the only one and he lives in a very yeah. specific area. And he, he brings me so much joy, the little squirrel. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Before I moved out of our parents' house, they started showing up in that neighborhood, too. Oh. I know. Adorable. And they're funny? a lot nicer than the gray squirrels. <laughs> Moving a little bit over to a couple of other tribes with the Ojibwe and the Cree, uh, they have a story that a boy, or sometimes a dwarf, depending upon the telling, I'm going to do my best with this name. I looked for a pronunciation of it, and I could not find one, or at least not one that gave me like a real one. Uh, uh, Tikabis? I believe, sought revenge on the sun for burning him. So despite the protests of his sister, he caught the sun in a snare during an eclipse and various animals tried to release the sun from this trap. This is super, super adorable. But only the lowly field mouse could chew through the ropes and set the sun back on its path. I was like, oh, no matter how small you are in this world, you're always important. So it was the field mouse that set the sun free. Oh, Going across the ocean into West Africa, I also looked for uh, the pronunciation on this, and I couldn't find one that sounded right. Bantam Maliba, they were an ancient people of what would now be northern Togo and Benin. According to their legend, human anger and fighting spread to the sun and the moon, and they began to fight with each other, and it causes an eclipse. The legendary first mothers, Puka Puka, and Kyo Koke urged the visitors to demonstrate peace to the sun and the moon to convince them to stop their brawl. During an eclipse, 
the Batam Maliba people make amends for old feuds and peacefully come together to encourage peace between the celestial bodies. And I saw that a couple times in history where some people did take it as a bad omen and it meant that they had to like bring peace to each other. And I was like, see, that that was what I thought was cool in history because to me, I always took it as like a bad omen, right? So last but not least, of course, we're going to talk about the Egyptians because, huh, you know, you can't not. <laughs> because the Egyptians. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> if it's history and it has to do with the sky, they're probably involved at some point. So surprisingly, ancient Egyptians did not leave any explicit records detailing solar eclipses. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, though such an event would probably have been observed by these astronomy-savvy sun worshippers, some scholars have suggested that perhaps eclipses were highly distressing and deliberately left unrecorded so as not to endow the event with any degree of permanence or tempt the sun god Ra. Yes? Do you want me to finish or do you want to ask your question? I'm just surprised at just like how long the ancient Egyptians were around that over yeah. all that yeah. time. I said the same thing. I was like, wait, what? Not one, <laughs> not one, not one person, not what? No, no one was like, well, kind of weird today. <laughs> not one person was dark. like, uh, I'm watching you. It's weird. It's a weird day. I mean, they kept really detailed records on this records of the sky that I remember. Every time I've learned about the Egyptians, they were like, uh, okay, hella into it. And like, went so hard on astronomy yeah that i mean that's my understanding but mm -hmm. I, okay all right I'm, i i think laurel go read a book at least again, <laughs> from what this says uh it was just deliberately left well this is what this person is okay. theorizing sure. is that it was left unrecorded because they okay. just don't talk about it. So it's not that it's a weird hole. It's just there's an absence of it. Sure. When you look at other civilizations of the time, everybody else is talking about it, but they're mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Kind of weird, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit more to the Egyptians. It said, one Egyptologist has suggested that various references to an apparently metaphorical form of blindness align with historical eclipse dates and may have been symbolic of these events, or perhaps the papyrus records were simply lost to time. <laughs> So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> so everybody went blind as hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't look at the sun, man. Okay. So to end this all off, here we go, everybody. In the words of the professor at Yale, he said, we're not that different. It, speaking of eclipses, he said, this is when in the intersection of us of today and our ancestors who brought us to today, uh, we're not that different from the people who lived thousands of years ago. As I mentioned, they were able to a certain extent predict these eclipses, even though some were afraid to do so. And even though, of course, this guy, he studies this stuff, right? Uh, he says, I know why it's happening and that it's just a basic mechanical thing, right? Shadows. Essentially, it's what comes, it's shadows, right? Interesting. And well, that's the really spark noted version of it. But uh, he said, it's such a powerful cosmic experience that there's an uncanniness associated with them, no matter whether it's then or now. Uh, and I think wherever you live or however educated you are, it still leaves an impression on people. And I just thought it was a nice place to leave it there because I do agree because no matter how many times we see these things, we can still be at awe of the cosmos. And I think that that's kind of a cool thing. It's nice to know that we don't know everything and there's still things that make us go, ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was yeah. great, Katie. Thank you. Yeah, a really nice sentiment to, to end that story well, on. Thank you. So there you go. There you yeah. have it. Eclipses. Eclipses. <laughs> and we had a great time with, with like sitting out in our driveway yesterday. It was a lot of fun. And I yeah, I, I think it was really exciting to like I think because I have a, a little one, you know, who did a really great job looking at the sun, which is awesome. <laughs> Kept his glasses yeah. on the whole time. Yeah, it was like really exciting for, to like do that with him and and like sort of he, explain it to a certain degree, you know, as, as best you say, can. How and, much does he get at this age? Uh, he he kind of just smiled and nodded a little bit. Like he he's like, oh yeah, oh, I sort of I sort of get it. Okay, all right. And then he's he would like put it down. And then later in bed last night, he was like, well, we didn't see the clips. We didn't see the clips. So I was like, well, the we sure, did, honey. we did. Yeah, I remember <laughs> when you put your glasses on, you looked up in the sun, and then he was like. 
it was boring. And I was like, <laughs> I knew yeah, that was yeah. going to be the answer. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's okay. I love astronomy, dude. <laughs> rocks. There's a lot of things I like. I think I'm starting to understand. If it's fun and exciting and I can learn more about it, I'm probably going to do that. Yeah. That's always good. Yeah. It's always good to learn more. And I hope that y'all had a, a great time <laughs> learning with us because that's basically what we are. We just are figuring out as we go and get to share the th- cool things that we learn with all of you and with our wonderful friends here in the smoke circle. So it's so great to, to be able to be back and do that again with you back in season three. It's been such a great time getting back into it again. And uh, thank you so much to Dr. Darren Reed to, for coming in and, and hanging out with us. Oh God, I'm so I'm not loud. <laughs> that was so much fun. So thank you for bringing your, for thanks bringing for your... having me guys. It was so much fun. I really yeah. loved listening to both of you talk. Um, yeah, it's just so it's also wonderful to be here and hear like folks like you talking about the past and your enthusiasm for it. It's really humbling. It's really lovely. So thank you for having me. Oh, well, thanks for, for being the Anytime. <laughs> the legit legit historian there who's come in and uh dealing dealing with our lowbrow <laughs> lowbrow. Hangs out with a couple of anything here was lowbrow. I thought you guys did such a good job and it just made it really entertaining as well. You know, I, yeah, I really love it. I, I really love being able to do this live with you guys. It's really special. So thank you for having me back. Oh, it's our absolute pleasure. And uh, yes. any anytime, we would love it. We love having, having say, on. Anytime you want to excitedly talk about history, you're one of mm-hmm. the few people I can do it without getting made fun of. So <laughs> come back. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back again in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, folks, get money, get high, give love, and... Don't look at the sun, okay? <laughs> like, don't do it. <laughs> but also enjoy these events safely because some of them only come around once in a lifetime and it's so worth it to see it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.